Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This is Damon Kirtan, Senior Journalist from XR Today, bringing you the latest and greatest from the VR, AR, and XR industries. Today, yet again, we have on an amazing guest. We have on Mr. David Ware. He is a creative producer, an immersive filmmaker, and the creator of the film Beyond the Mask. So, David, it's a pleasure to have you on today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Brilliant. So, yeah, we're going to kick things off. Tell me a little bit about your filmmaking career. Um, uh, what is it that you like to do with your professional um, career? Um, I've, I like to produce, I think, is, is the simplest way. Uh, and by produce to any non-filmmakers, that tends to mean be the driving force behind any project. Um, often from inception or grasping onto an idea, bringing people together, and just seeing it all the way through, not only the glamorous bit of the production, but you know the post-production, editing, getting it out there, whether it's festivals or onto a platform and, and beyond, and, and you know constantly pushing it. Um, I, I enjoy gathering the, the the people around me, so to say. Um, in my experience, the best producers that I've I've met and worked with are people that have done a bit of everything and as such they they know what everyone does and they respect the people around them um, because they know how hard they work and uh, I've sort of really adopted that approach myself and uh, I've effectively done a bit of everything I've spent a long time in in Hollywood UK industry uh, film industry uh, on the the bigger budget side on, on some of the biggest films in the world uh, whereby I've worked in assistant directing locations in the production and the, you know the, the heart of the, of, of the films uh, and you really get a chance to speak to all of the creative individuals all the heads of department all the people that are making things happen including elements that you, you just would never think about as, as, as a normal audience member and you really get to understand how people make magic happen um, and, and that's been a huge part of my life and obviously paid the bills for a long, long time um, a lot of respect for for that side of the industry the other side of the industry i would say is i've, I've spent a lot of time as a producer um creating films uh, sh short films working with from students to to higher level uh, professionals and individuals getting things out to festivals making some uh, feature low, lower budget feature films usually i'm always experimenting with uh, like my, me myself i'm always experimenting with something that's different uh trying to push the boat or or uh, hit some niche that's not yet explored well enough because i think uh, there's there's always something to say and, uh, and something to do which uh you know at the moment brings me into virtual reality and and xr as medium which um the main thing i'm trying to explore here uh, is is the narrative filmmaking i spent a lot of time uh, studying story as a hugely helpful part of producing is to be able to speak the same language as a lot of the people that you work with and that includes the writers and to then understand and break down what writers do incredibly complicated um and fascinating um sets of rules and structure and um again like so then it's, it's putting all of that and then the cinematography you know putting all of that into virtual reality um is is a new challenge because you can't just directly translate 2d into like the 3d immersive um it, it it doesn't work and i've seen some examples uh, that are out there on the internet and obviously we're at the beginning stages so there's no knocking on anything anyone's done it's seeing what does doesn't work and what we can build uh, together to, to to create this this industry you know evolution and, and platforms for it great excellent stuff and um you know we noticed that you know immersive filmmaking has become quite popular over the last few um years and what we've seen, we've seen people like, uh, we spoke to Ryan McKinnon, who was doing some work for Avengers Sevenfold. And then we also spoke to Gary Yost and then a few other filmmakers who are realizing that this is probably the next wave of um, content that people can produce for a filmmaking industry. So I know that you've, um, you've worked with a few of these different formats. So, um, so you work with VR 180 degree filmmaking and also 360, like what would you say is the difference between the two of those? Um, I'll, I'll be uh, upfront and say I've done not much uh, with regards to the 360, I've looked into it, but um, what I've found is, and I think I've said this on a, a different stream with you, that, that is that this new technology is exciting, right? It's the buzzword and 
Uh, the term I tend to use is VR is a sandbox, right? It's, it's, a, it's a play area where everyone can go and explore in every avenue. And people are, and that's absolutely vital to the, to the industry. And it's, I, compl- I couldn't applaud it enough, applaud it enough. But what that also means is there's a lack of focus, perhaps, in certain areas um, because people are always looking for the new, but they're not developing um, the to get existing formats. For example, um, I don't know whether I'm allowed to mention like brand names or anything, but if I say Netflix and chill as a hashtag, right? You as an audience or any of the audiences watching this instantly have an idea of what that means, uh, what they're going to be watching, what kind of, you know, what's on Netflix, you know, generally it's what it's, what's it known for? It's, it's known for, uh, it's sort of immersive 2D content films and TV series primarily. Obviously, they've expanded so on and so forth since. But um, to 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 the under, the audiences understand the platform now with virtual reality, we don't yet. No one's done enough of one thing to build up any kind of expectation, any set of rules. Um, so, with regard to VR three hundred and sixty, again, very experimental. Um, most of the stuff I've seen uh, is usually static camera and then the camera jumps because obviously you've got to film in all directions. It's really hard to keep a narrative that you follow. Uh, I remember a few years ago, uh, I can't remember who did it, but I remember watching a 361 that was kind of Cloverfield-esque um, where there was like a monster attacking the city. And what really bothered me as an audience member watching it was that the my viewpoint as the camera, and I was looking all around, but. I, the camera was moving and I felt like I was on rails on a roller coaster and it really irritated me. Um, but it, you know, so it was a start and it was someone doing something and that's awesome. Um, but the rules weren't yet established as to how to make it immersive enough because I was watching what was going on, but I wasn't fully immersed because I was irritated at the fact that it was moving unlike how I would move. And these are things that we need to figure out. Um, so my approach, I've spent more time working on virtual reality 180. Uh, the film that we've released that you mentioned earlier, it's called Beyond the Mask. I've actually got a post there. Uh, but um, it's a VR 180 stereoscopic narrative short. It's a lot of words. But what that essentially means is VR 180 is what you're, you know, for any viewers that, that don't know this technology that well, VR 180, 180 degrees, it's all pretty much just a little bit wider than our natural eyesight can see. So it's super realistic. It's almost like you're there in the room. Um, obviously, VR, virtual reality. Uh, what this means is it's also the closest to normal cinema that we have in terms of when you shoot and you've got a camera lens, you've got dead spots behind the camera that we're not currently looking at. Now, VR 180 affords that same ability that you have dead spots that you can potentially, you know, light it from or stand the crew there or, or whatever it is you're going to do. Um, but also as the closest to normal cinema, I, I think that the, in terms of learning and teaching, the transitions for industry and audiences is lesser than going directly to 360, which is much more extreme and much more difficult to focus the audience's attention. As a filmmaker, and especially as a narrative filmmaker, you're trying to tell a story, which means you're uh, trying to get the audience to focus on the details and elements that you want them to and to pick up on, to then be engaged in, in the story that you're trying to tell. Now, in normal cinema, you can do lots of cuts and transitions or close-ups of this coffee mug that's really special to, you know, the poison weapon later on in, you know. Um, but in virtual reality 180, you know, I can see everything. So we've got to figure out how do we do the equivalent of a close-up? How do we keep the audience's attention instead of them looking around the scene and, oh, my shoelaces are fantastic whilst Two characters are having an argument that you really need to see over there. Um, these are all questions that, that filmmakers need to answer. So I think VR 180 is closest to normal cinema, but it is still a new challenge, a new step. And I think that this is definitely the future of of, of cinema. Um, and that's that's what I'm trying to check and tackle effectively is building up this cinematic rulebook. Yeah, definitely. Like uh, I remember going to see certain plays or like certain uh, performances and. You know, you had a stage where it was kind of interactive and people were looking at different parts of it. Oh, there's someone up at the top. You know, you think about Phantom of the Opera and things like that. I think um, 180 degree like immersive filmmaking is kind of the next step in that, where you have the ability to kind of control the focus of what audiences are looking at. 
So it's going to be really nice to see it beyond the mask and see like how it incorporates those same kind of elements into it. So um, yeah, great work on that. Speaking a bit further about it, I wanted to ask you about some of the kit that you use to actually create your films. Because of course the Canon EOS um, VR is out and it's been like really, really popular amongst filmmakers like Alan Bukaria, who um, did his uh, This Is Bike Life um, cinematography. So for you, what kind of kit do you incorporate to your workflow? Um, I would say um, up front, I'm not I the expert say... on all the technological side of things. However, obviously, I do know what you know what we used, and um, the the, uh, the we did also go with the the Canon EOS V five C dual uh, fisheye lens um, camera uh, because, as uh, again, a lot of the advertisement says, and there's a lot of the uh, the YouTubers and streamers out, out there mentioned it. It's a it's a kit that requires the least stitching in post-production you know it does a, a lot of the what you need it to do um it, it does it for you uh rather than obviously the older fashion where you've got two gopros next to each other and you've got to stitch together or you've got you know different different camera setups which again is obviously another issue with the, the 360 that you have to have multiple and i know there are many systems out there that um uh, people are starting to work on and starting, starting to promote. And obviously, yeah, it just, it, it means more time in the edit, obviously stitching it together for whatever it is you want. But obviously my focus was to try to have the easiest piece of kit that we could use in terms of playing. Like part of my goal for Beyond a Mask was I had certain questions that I wanted to answer. Um, it's, it's a standalone film, absolutely. Um, and, that's, and that's key. Obviously you want to get audiences to watch it and to enjoy a film. But as a filmmaker, I also wanted to hit another side of it to appeal to filmmakers and start answering some of those questions that I mentioned. You know, how do you move the camera? How do you do a transition? You know, if you just start cutting, um, then the audience is going to be jumping around everywhere and then they're going to be like, oh, I'm over here because we can't do that in normal life. You know, I can't suddenly just jump to another room. And if I do, then suddenly I'm going to be like, oh, what, what's going on? And I'm not going to be looking at what the filmmaker wants me to look at. Um, so as such, because I had certain things I wanted to play with and a big one of them was movement. Um, I wanted the easiest pieces of kit that we could have so that we could do so. So, uh, we designed the film that was, um, in this instance, fairly simple in terms of how we were going to make it so that we didn't have to play around with kit, uh, and do too many elements that are outside our knowledge, which enabled us to focus more on using, uh, the gyroscopic handheld uh, and using the camera, which again, being a light body camera uh, and a small package lends itself really well to sort of handheld filmmaking because a lot of the projects I've seen out there are static and static camera and fair play, the filmmakers, I've seen some really cool stuff that's going on with those, but I don't think that that's the future. I think that camera movement is the future. You watch normal TV, it's an art, the how the camera moves in itself tells part of the story. And I think it would be stupid to say that that's not gonna be a huge part of what virtual reality and movie making is. Uh, and it's gonna be, now there'll be times when static camera will be you know, needed and, and part of the creative choice, but I don't want it to be the only choice. Um, so with that in mind, the, the Canon set was, was perfect for that. Uh, we had a mount on it that was, um, I can't remember the name of it now, but it's uh, one of the, I think it's one of the more standard uh, sound uh, mic kits that's kind of got ears on the side of it. So it catches uh, the the all sounds similar to, again, to, to how the human ear would be if you're in the room. So the audience has that perspective as much as possible um, because immersion is everything for, for VR filmmaking, right? You want the audience, uh, for, sorry, for narrative VR filmmaking. You want the audience as immersed in what's going on as possible. That's why no jumping around cutting. And again, the choice of perspective, whether you choose to have them with arms, whether you choose to have the characters interact with them is all a choice that the director needs to make in advance of filming. Uh, so we did the same with um, the audio. And um, for better or worse, I, in honesty, I would like to have had um, spent more time and perhaps tested further. Uh, I would like to have had perhaps lapel mics on some of the characters. Um, we spent a lot of time in post-production working therefore on boosting voices, adjusting elements and uh, as characters obviously at different distances, because again, with the setup that we chose to use, 
it was as if we were in the room. So some people are further away, some people are closer. And obviously, as everybody's moving around, it, it adds different dynamics. Um, again, a lot of it is conscious choice, but it's all really interesting to, to find out and to play with. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you get the chance to, like, achieve different kinds of cinematic styles. You know, I always look back to films that I really enjoy, like Memento or Fight Club, things like that, where you had um, a lot of different new kind of cinematography introductions into filmmaking, and that became like that director or that producer's style. So I'm interested to yeah. see what kind of new yeah. styles will take place with 180-degree filmmaking and, and, you know, also 360. So, yeah, the excellent um, observations about that. Um, I wanted to also ask you, you know, of course, you're working – with other people who want to get into this space. And um, I wanted to ask you, how are you empowering more people in the immersive filmmaking space through the work that you do? Um, well, with regard to where I am, I I obviously have an internet presence that I'm trying to to, to boost and try and get involved in as many conversations as possible, um, as well as, you know, and now having something, some some, some work, et cetera, in, in the VR space to back, back that up. Um, but also I'm based in uh, Europe in uh, a country called Slovenia, which actually has quite a small film scene. Now, I'm obviously native to British. I come from the UK industry, which is big and it's booming. And it's, you know, it, all the major film studios are sold out for the next decade. And that's been my bread and butter for, for, for many years, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but what that means is I also have uh, a fairly unique to the environment I find myself in a fairly unique, um, not necessarily skill set, but a breadth of experience that I can I can bring to this. Now, there are a lot of areas. One person can't do anything. Anyone that's made a film knows that you can't do it all yourself. Or if you do, then it, it's, it's all consuming. Um, so it's very much a people game. And um, as such, working with people here, now I chose to work with the, the platform that um, released the, the film and uh, host the film. Um, I pitched it to them uh, initially as, uh, as, as an idea of, sort of this, this film uh, as part of a series. And again, as I've explained, the series, not only are they standalone you know, individual films and sort of jumping straight into a giant feature film, um, the, the series each tackle different elements, not only of different stories, which are beautiful, some may be targeted at festival winning, et cetera, um, but also to tackle different elements of uh, VR filmmaking and the questions that we mentioned earlier, how do you transition? How do you cut? Do you have to do it when a character goes to sleep, for example, um, or when the lights go out? Or are there other ways? Can you do a swipe cut um, as you go past a wall and then you swipe back and you're somewhere different? You know, all these things need to be played with to, to, to find out. Um, and the companies that I'm working with here, they do work in um, uh, an aspect of virtual reality films, but Again, within films, there are so many different types of filmmaking. You know, even you've got narrative fiction, you've got high end TV, which again is a different style. You've got documentaries, you know, you've got short films, you've got trailers. Every, every, all of these are completely different styles of filmmaking, music videos, you know, um, where you can do different things and they have different established rules. So I was again bringing in a lot of my research into. Um, the people here that I, I was fortunate enough to work with uh, and knowledge of how to tell a story, as well as in this instance, I was uh, directing the project. So I kind of obviously had the vision of, of where I wanted to be. So it's working with um, you know, the editors and, and visual effects as to what can we do? Or, you know, how, how can we not do it? Obviously, these people specialize in what they specialize in. They're incredibly more knowledgeable than, than I am. I just have a basic sense and, you know, that's a director's job, right? To, have a vision and be like how you know ask you how do we make it how do we get that to happen what compromises do we have to make and so on and so forth and i think overall that you know the people did fantastically and hopefully we had a, a symbiotic relationship where they learned a lot from me about this particular medium and um and and likewise i, I learned some and managed to tick every box that i wanted to hit on uh, on the, the film that we produced um and you know have released um and aside from that obviously as you mentioned, like in, international audiences, the more the conversation spreads, the more we get out and the more these avenues of thought get out, then hopefully again, it's, I'm, I'm, as I've said, I'm, I want this to be a conversation starter. 
it's by no means the end and i'm never going to put it out there as such it's it's opening up these questions and asking other people you know other filmmakers other creatives to come back and and um and come back with answers and, and ways to play with it to, because we all benefit right if we all create come together to create the next medium and establish the rules for storytelling then that's going to encourage more people uh, more general audiences to uh, buy headsets because uh as i mentioned on a another cast with you was um it's it's the chicken and the egg. Why why would anyone buy a TV if there's nothing to watch? So why are people gonna buy headsets if there's not that much to do? If we can all come together to create content, that's amazing. And and we do that by working together at this stage. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's the community, you know, spirit that you create using um, you know, new technologies, you're able to kind of foster or facilitate that kind of conversation amongst different filmmakers. Like, okay, how do we get this angle? Uh, how would you incorporate this uh, technology into your workflow and so on and so on, leading by example to say. Now, we have the next question, I guess the, the, last, the last and final question, uh, the, the 3,500, you know, quid question. <laughs> uh, what do you think about the Apple Vision Pro? <laughs> um, do you think it's going to be something that will actually help to change the game? when it comes to immersive filmmaking, you know, as a platform for people to experience content? I think yes and no. Um, obviously, yes and there's, no. Never a, there's never a simple answer to anything. But um, yeah, Apple's the buzzword at the moment um, with, with what they've released. And I think that the new headset, I don't think anything at the moment is specifically targeted at filmmaking. Uh, which fair enough. Um, obviously, the, I think all the headsets in general are because they're such an interactive medium, whereas filmmaking is a passive medium. Generally speaking, you know, you're an audience, you watch, you don't play. Now, I believe these lend themselves really well to semi-passive uh, or semi-interactive, you know, where, whereby probably some future films will have certain elements where, you know, if it's a detective thing, you as the audience might be able to touch a book or flip the page or something like that or choose a something from a menu or something like that where there's you know like um a black mirror bandersnatch you know did the choose your own adventure thing on, on a 2d platform and um, brilliant and i think apple have initially i think they are just bringing their presence to to the industry to say hey we think this is something which more people are going to take note of which is great um in terms of this headset itself, I think due to the price, I personally believe that due to the price range um, and what it does, again, I think that is a conversation starter. It's not aimed at the same audience that Meta target. Um, Meta target, the, the wider audience trying to get more people involved to buy headsets into gaming uh, and they're trying to diversify um, into, you know, into, into businesses, trying to make it more practical to use in the office spaces as well. And I think Apple have, kind of bridged both and more uh, to show that this is what can be done. And I don't think it's this console or this console generation that is going to be the mass one. It's going to be a couple of generations time when everyone's seen these ideas, built upon them, incorporated them into much sleeker, more presentable headsets. Because uh, I mean, someone I saw the other day said, you know, oh, the Apple trying to make it look really sexy um, for that price bracket, you know, and it's like, it's not really that sexy though, is it? It's a giant flipping ski goggles on the front and the back. And you, you're not, just because you can see a projection of somebody's eyes or, or on it, it doesn't mean it's cool. And it doesn't, doesn't look cool, let's be honest. But in a couple of generations time, when we figured out how to make it that much thinner and it's no different to some sunglasses, um, then it will be. And then it will be able to do so much more. And then hopefully by that point, creators such as myself and, and some of the other creators that, that we've had on um, will have created more to watch, more to do, the applications for office use of these headsets, of meetings across the world, of AR um, applications and uh, you know visual screens in front of you that are interactable, MR, um, as well as gaming, as well as films, as well as you know other, other elements that we have not even thought of yet. Um, are going to be so much further down the road. And it's obviously it's just taken us a long time to get there because virtual reality technology has existed since what, the 70s, 80s. Um, you know, a lot of the older generation I speak to, they're like, oh yeah, I remember when 
you know, virtual reality. And it doesn't seem that much different, but lots of concepts as well with like the Apple headset aren't that different concepts. But the point is the technology has increased so much now and they've put it all together in one space. And that is good. That's really important. Um, and then, yeah, I'm mean, excited to see what the future holds and, and where it holds. And this, this is a plethora of people that are creating some stuff you, you just never think of. It's, it's amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, when you were talking about that, I had these images flashing in my mind about the Nintendo VR, <laughs> where it was just kind of like red and black lights and everything at that specific time. You know, it was a novel idea. It was a great way for Nintendo to kind of explore those types of mediums for playing video games, but unfortunately it didn't take off. So I think we'll see yeah. a repeat of that with some of yeah. the different headsets that people come out with until they get the form factor, the battery life and comfort and other things like that squared away. So that way people can adopt them for much longer because, yeah, um, I mean, you know, bringing it down to... Yeah, I mean, it's a big problem. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was going to say, well, that's a, a big part oh, sorry, I was gonna um, say, well, that's a... of the evolution. Obviously, however many years ago, we didn't have the technology. Now, obviously, one thing that Meta do have going for them is that they've sunk billions into it. So they are the big dog in the game, so to say. Uh, and are, are keen to, to be so and remain so. But I think it's really good that, uh, you know, like Apple coming on board signifies that this is, this is going to be something. It's, you know, Meta are not giving up. And that's awesome. I think all of us have had this dream of, you know, the Star Trek holodecks kind of thing, uh, since we, you know, it was ever conceived. Um, and obviously just in the world that we're in today, it won't be long. It genuinely within a decade, mobile phones will be gone. Um, and we'll all have these eyebrow implants or sunglasses or whatever it is that does everything because that is the inevitable future. It's so much more applicable. And obviously the other thing I didn't mention, the, the, obviously the Apple's hands tracking, obviously that's, that's the future. Why would you have like controller consoles? Um, it, it doesn't make sense. It's not convenient to carry on your person or carry around. And presumably these headsets will be able to be used you walk around the streets, you know, every day. It's it's the the Disney movie Wally. Um, sadly, to an extent, probably will come to life. You know, where we're all walking side by side, yet we're looking ahead and talking to each other on the screen. Um, this is the sad part of human nature, right? Uh, is is you know we, we tend to go for the latest <laughs> approach. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's still exciting, and obviously within that, we've got plenty of rules that we're going to have to create, and uh, many ways that people find to obviously abuse these systems. But the, the creative, the creative sides are, are definitely like spearheading it at the moment and, and, and booming. And I, I can't wait to see them in the workplaces. And, um, yeah, um, def yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, great points on that. Specifically, like um, also with um, you know, the way Apple is presenting its hardware and everything. I will also add on to that um, with the MetaQuest 3. I think we'll see some quite interesting surprises with that, especially with Reality SDK they've got. So they may try to make some um, kind of hand tracking that can compete with Apple, maybe not to the same degree, but um, I know that they have been working on that with the Quest 2, but at a different price point. And I think it has like a 40% thinner, um, yeah. you know, form factor so i think that's going to also kind of up the ante and now we see like some genuine competition within the market between those two htc vibe and a few others yeah so yeah great great um, just have to hope they start working you together um yeah well, yeah thank you thank you for having me uh, i mean yeah at the moment it's uh, we have the competitive nature of the industries um which you know is, is vital for them to push each other absolutely but um, the more buzz that's created, the more people that can come on board, hopefully, from, from general public, which then creates more of a, a mass. Like, obviously, Xbox recently released an announcement that they're not yet going to invest in, in the industry. They're going to wait and see for a while, which, fair enough. Uh, maybe that will just put them behind. Um, but maybe not. You know, we'll see until, arguably, the other companies, like, bands together to not take down meta but to, to rival meta um but uh, obviously apple and uh, apple tends to kind of do its own thing and it looks like meta is kind of doing its own thing so i think that everybody else is kind of going to have to 
maybe it'll be a three horse race that you know the HTC or the Steam Deck or you know, not Steam Deck but the, the Steam uh, will end up combining or something like that to then become I don't know three horse powerhouse race. But as long as there's the content for everybody, because that that's my side of it, and that's always my my interest is making sure that there's something to do, there's something to watch. Otherwise, why buy it? You know, why buy any of them? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much. It's been absolute um, fascinating conversation. And, you know, these are going to be very interesting times. So we'll continue to follow these developments over the next few months. Uh, we're going to see a lot of things come out in the space, I think, for 2023. So, yeah, once mm -hmm. again, everyone, we've been speaking to David Ware. He is the creative producer. He is a creative, a creative producer and immersive filmmaker and the creator of Beyond the Mask. So I'm going to go ahead and I include some links to the information on that in the comments below. And uh, once again, my name is Devon Curitan, Senior Journalist from XR Today. If you like these conversations, please follow us at the XR News hashtag or on Twitter and LinkedIn. It's been a pleasure speaking with everyone today. And until next time, catch you then. Bye now.